All businesses, all organizations from the smallest to the very largest need a leader. They have their committees, their echelons of command, and perhaps a widely dispersed group of semi-autonomous divisions. But the overall company and each of its divisions must have strong and able leadership. Contrary to popular belief, you do not raise morale in an organization. It filters down from the top. The attitudes of the people working in any organization will always reflect the attitude of the leader. And finally, this leader will always be found to be just one person. The man or woman on the white horse. I'm sure you're aware that even the largest and oldest companies with many thousands of employees and hundreds of management people will, when they find themselves in trouble or not doing as well as they should, seek out one person and place him or her in the position of final authority. The whole company, the board of directors, and perhaps thousands of stockholders all look to this one person for leadership and success. Whatever you find a successful going concern, whether it's a gas station, a supermarket, a school club, PTA, or a well-organized home, you'll find behind its success an outstanding leader. This is the most valuable person in society. In industry, he or she makes the wheels turn, the entire economy work. This is the person who's been responsible for the growth of nations and their position in the world. The employer of millions, the dreamer, the planner, and a clock to him or her is something that other people watch. You'll find this person working early and late, and when not working, he or she is usually thinking and planning. Way back during the Depression of the 1930s, the phrase most often heard by employers was, I'll do anything, just give me a job. Millions were unemployed. Thousands of business firms had closed their doors, and outside employment offices, long lines of people stood waiting for any kind of work. It was during this time in Long Beach, California, crowded to overflowing with thousands who had migrated there looking for work when there wasn't enough work to go around for the permanent residents, it seemed, that a friend of mine made an interesting discovery. He found that he could go to work almost anywhere he chose. Now, amazing as this may sound, it was absolutely true. It dawned upon him one day that the business establishments of various kinds were just as anxious to succeed as were the people looking for work. The owners and managers of these businesses were worried and concerned over the hard times which had descended upon the country, and a great many of them were looking for someone to come to their aid, the person who would somehow show up and solve their business problems. But all they heard was people asking for work and saying, I'll do anything. These people were asking for a paycheck from a company which was very likely teetering on the brink of financial ruin itself. And so signs appeared in windows all over the land reading, No Help Wanted. This was a negative form of advertising, and while it kept the plaintive hordes away from the door, it also hurt business. Well, this friend of mine decided to become a part of the solution instead of a part of the problem. And his method was simple, and it worked like a charm. He selected the kind of business he felt he would like to work in, and in which he could build a career. He then devoted a month to finding out all he could about that particular business. He talked to other people in the same line. He heard their problems and what they felt was wrong. He talked for hours, asking questions, probing about what they felt was needed, and so on. He went to the public library and read everything he could find on that industry. And then he began to think of ways and means by which this business might be improved. When he was ready and finally made his call on the company for which he had decided to work, instead of asking for a job, he said to the boss something like this, I believe I know of several ways in which your business can be greatly increased, and I'd like to talk to you about them. Well, here he was, selling the one thing on earth in which his prospect was most interested. The fact that he knew a good deal about the business now permitted him to talk intelligently. He took a positive attitude, expressed a willingness to pitch in and help put the business on a sound and profitable footing. And, of course, that's right, he got the job. Millions out of work and asking for jobs. But one man who found a way to be of help. What had he done? Well, first he had specialized. He had selected one line of work and decided that that was where his future would be. Now he had to prove himself, and he did. The jack-of-all-trades and master-of-none was the man who suffered during the Depression, 
people who knew what they were doing and where they were going sailed through those depression years just like a large ship sailed through a storm. It wasn't as comfortable as it could have been, but at least the crossing was a success. At least they didn't founder. And thousands of businesses actually grew larger and prospered during the Depression. The best way for you to develop the security that lasts a lifetime is to become outstanding at one particular line of work. Look at it this way. Regardless of economic ups and downs, the industry of which that line of work is a part will continue to operate. It won't shut down completely. As long as you're in the top 5% of the people in that industry, you know you'll always be in demand. You'll be wanted and needed, not just where that industry is concerned, but where you and your family are concerned also. The man or woman who becomes truly outstanding at what he or she does has the world on a string. Here's the person of confidence and peace of mind. Here's the person who's quietly aware of his or her ability and intimate knowledge of his or her job in particular industry. Here's the homemaker or student who's at the top of the group. They've got it made, and they and everybody else know it. Ask yourself this question. Am I now such a person? Down deep inside, you know the answer. If you answered yes, you're among the most fortunate people and in one of the smallest and most elite groups on earth. If your answer was no, it can be turned into a yes in a surprisingly short time. The first step is to make one really big and important decision. It's a decision the great majority of people never make and suffer as a result. Failing to make this decision keeps a person from ever really getting on course or clarifying his or her goals. If you make the decision I'm now going to recommend, you can take a deep breath, give a comfortable sigh of relief, fix your eyes firmly upon your target, and go to work relaxed, comfortable, and sure in the knowledge that the success you seek will be yours. The great steel magnet Andrew Carnegie, when asked the formula for success, answered, put all your eggs in one basket, and then watch that basket. Let's be frankly realistic. Who gets laid off work during an economic slump? Well, what gets thrown over the side when a ship is in danger of going down? Everything not absolutely essential to the operation of the vessel and the safety of its passengers. And it's the same with a business or any other organization. It has to be that way. Anyone who will be honest with himself or herself realizes that he or she has been happiest and most satisfied after having successfully completed a difficult job. A leader is a person who can help and lead others. It's the conscientious mother who wants her children to grow up knowing the rules for success and happiness. It's the father who shows by example that any job worth doing is worth doing well. It's the student who studies to learn, not just to get a grade, who has a mind of his or her own and sets the pace for his or her fellow students. It's the farmer whose farm sets an example in his area and the small businessman or woman whose business continues to grow and prosper with the passing years. It's the employee who has the good sense to realize that one gets most out of any job by giving loyalty and dedication to the firm that pays his or her wages. A leader is any person who realizes the importance of becoming a bigger and better person with the passing of every day, week, and month. A leader takes the responsibility of his or her own growth a planner, a thinker, a doer. Each of us can become such a leader in our own area of activity. It's not difficult, and in the long run, it's easier for us and on us than what at first may appear to be the easier of two courses. There's a seemingly harmless phrase that has swept the country. People no longer simply say goodbye. They almost inevitably add, take care. But I contend it's wrong to say Take care. Instead, say, take a chance, take charge, take control. Why? Why, because people who take care never get anywhere. If you want to manage your problem successfully, you need to take a chance, take charge, and take control. Taking a chance by itself is a reckless risk. But when you take charge, you manage that risk. When you take control, you manage your problem. Take charge. Take control. That means never surrender leadership. What do I mean by leadership? I'll give it to you in a sentence. Leadership is the force 
that selects your dreams and sets your goals. Your life can be powerful and your problems can be overcome if you will take charge and take control by learning and following the dynamic leadership principles outlined in this session. You would be amazed how many so-called leaders are unaware of these principles. Before they know it, they lose control and are defeated by problems they should have been able to manage successfully. Never surrender leadership to outside forces. In a corporate structure, leadership is not always at the desk of the president or the chairman of the board. Too often, people in top positions surrender their power to outside forces. I know this to be true. Some years ago, my congregation met in a small church building. Like so many other churches and corporations, we surrendered leadership to the property. The church board was not in command. The pastor was not in control. People said, we can't do that. We don't have enough parking. We can't carry out that program. We don't have a large enough auditorium. Then this thought came to me. The shoe doesn't tell the foot how big to grow. The body doesn't surrender leadership to the garment. Don't surrender leadership to forces such as property, buildings, location. If you need to rebuild or relocate, then take charge and take control. Never surrender leadership to property. Don't let your property tell you how big to grow. God can think through a brain, but God can't think through a brick. When you're in a leadership position, whether it's in a business or as the head of a family, honesty and integrity are not as important as money or shelter or a telephone. Honesty and integrity are infinitely more important than any of those things. They're about as important as having air and food and water. For a leader, honesty and integrity are absolutely essential to survival. A lot of business people don't realize how closely they're being watched by their subordinates. Remember when you were a kid in grammar school? How you used to sit there staring at your teacher all day? By the end of the school year, I'll bet you could have done a perfect imitation of all your teacher's mannerisms. I'll bet you were aware of the slightest nuances in your teacher's voice. All the little clues that distinguished levels of meaning that told you the difference between bluff and now I mean business. You were able to do that after eight or nine months of observation. Suppose you had five or ten years. Do you think there would have been anything about your teacher you didn't know? As a manager, there probably isn't anything your people don't know about you right this minute. If you haven't been totally above board and honest with them, it's certain you haven't gotten away with it. But if you've been led to believe that you've gotten away with it, it's most likely because people are afraid of you. That's a problem in its own right. But there's another side of the coin, too. In any organization, people want to believe in their leaders. If you give them reason to trust you, they're not going to go looking for reasons to think otherwise and they'll be just as perceptive about your positive qualities as they are about the negative ones. I heard a story of a situation that happened some time ago at a company in the Midwest. The wife of a new employee experienced complications in the delivery of a baby. There was a medical bill of more than $10,000, and the health insurance didn't want to cover it. The employee hadn't been on the payroll long enough, the pregnancy was a pre-existing condition, one thing or another. In any case, the employee was desperate. He approached the company CEO and asked him to talk to the insurance people. The CEO agreed, and the next thing the employee knew, the bill was gone. The charges were rescinded. But when he mentioned to some colleagues the way the CEO had so readily used his influence with the insurance company... They just shook their heads and smiled. The CEO had paid the bill out of his own pocket, and everybody knew it, no matter how quietly it had been done. An act of dishonesty can't be hidden, 
and it will instantly undermine the authority of a leader. But an act of integrity is just as obvious to all concerned. When you're in a leadership position, you have the choice of how you will be seen, but you will be seen one way or the other. Make no mistake about that. Leadership of a family demands even higher standards of honesty and integrity. And the stakes are higher, too. You can replace disgruntled employees and start over. You can even get a new job for yourself if it comes to that. But your family can't be shuffled like a deck of cards. If you haven't noticed, kids are great moral philosophers, especially as they get into adolescence. They're determined to discover and expose any kind of hypocrisy, phoniness, or lack of integrity on the part of authority figures. And if we're parents, that means us. It's frightening how unforgiving kids can be about this, but it really isn't a conscious decision on their part. It's just a necessary phase of growing up. They're testing everything, especially parents. In Arthur Miller's great play, Death of a Salesman, it's hard to believe that a son would so completely lose faith in his father based on a single incident of dishonesty. Once a parent has lost moral authority, it is very, very difficult to regain it. Studies have shown that children are extremely understanding about many things. If you accidentally step on a favorite toy, that will quickly be forgiven, if not forgotten. If you lose your job and the family has to move, they'll adjust. If parents just can't get along and decide to divorce, most kids can handle it, but they can't handle dishonesty. It can take many, many years before that will be forgiven. As a person of integrity yourself, you'll find it easy to teach integrity to your kids, and they in turn will find it easy to accept you as a teacher. This is a great opportunity and also a supreme responsibility because kids simply must be taught to tell the truth, to mean what they say, and to say what they mean. There was something interesting about the Indians of the Southwest and the skills they felt were important for their children to know. Hiding was one of them. In a desert environment where you would think there was nowhere at all to hide except possibly by squeezing yourself behind a cactus plant, the Indian children could literally disappear. And running was another very important ability. Beginning as young as six or seven years of age, Indian children were taught to run long distances while holding a mouthful of water in order to develop breath control. And of course, both running and hiding were skills that could save the life of an Indian child as well as preserve the security of the group. Kids today must be taught skills that will save their lives. And integrity is one of those vitally important skills. Maybe it's hard to convince yourself of that. I heard a story of a man who flew propeller-driven anti-submarine planes for the Navy, piloted them on long flights over the water. He told of an incident when a storm was coming up and they were faced with a difficult navigational problem in order to avoid it. The problem became even more difficult when the navigator revealed that he couldn't handle it. He cheated his way through some parts of the training, but that training material didn't seem like it would ever be very useful. I can't promise that it will ever save their lives, but nothing you will ever do is more important than teaching integrity to your children. There's an old saying, those who do can and those who can't teach. But you really can't teach honesty unless you are honest yourself. You really can't teach integrity unless you also live with integrity. It's actually quite simple. It might be tempting for the sake of consistency to assert that you should always tell the whole truth exactly as you see it in every situation. But I've lived long enough in the real world to know things just aren't that simple. Shakespeare wrote of one of his characters, Every man has his fault, 
and honesty is his. He is more honest than wise. Just as there is a difference between blowing hot air and premeditated dishonesty, there's also a difference between lying and recognizing the importance of diplomacy. How can you tell the difference? Your gut feelings will tell you. By the time we reach adulthood, I think most of us have extremely accurate ethical barometers built into our heads and hearts. We may choose to ignore what that ethical barometer tells us, but it's there nonetheless. When you're in a leadership role, I believe there's at least one situation in which you're almost always justified in stretching the truth to some degree. And here it is. You should overstate your degree of enthusiasm for your employee's work. You may use many, many carrots and very few sticks. Your recipe for dealing with subordinates should include at least three parts praise for every one part of criticism. Will this stretching of the truth cost you respect? I don't think so. Will a little sugarcoating of your true feelings foster greater productivity, better work, and improved morale? Absolutely. And that conclusion is supported by a great deal of behavioral science research. Praise is one of the world's most effective teaching and leadership tools. Criticism and blame, even if deserved, are counterproductive unless all other approaches have failed. We can call it diplomacy or psychology or just plain flattery, but it often brings out the best in people, and it's the grease that keeps the machine of human interactions functioning smoothly. So honesty is the best policy, but sometimes a little less than total honesty is even better. We all know people who have gotten ahead as a result of dishonest or unethical behavior. When you're a kid, you think that never happens. But when you get older, you realize that it does. Then you think you've really wised up, but that's not the end of it. When you get older, you see the long-term consequences of dishonest gain, and you realize that it doesn't pay in the end. I've seen people who have made millions with questionable business tactics, and I've also seen a higher percentage of health problems among those people than any insurance actuary could possibly account for. I've seen people who decided to sell out their friends or their business partners in order to cash a big check, and those people wind up looking 20 years older than their age. Stick around, keep your eyes open, and I think you'll see it's true. Hope of dishonest gain is the beginning of loss. That's another old saying. I don't think it refers to the loss of money. I think it means loss of self-respect. You can have all the material things in the world, but if you've lost respect for yourself, what have you really got? The only way to ever attain success and enjoy it is to achieve it honestly and with pride in what you've done. Hey, that's not just a sermon. That's very practical advice. You can not only take it to heart, you can take it to the bank. The program. Dennis, it's a real privilege to have you with us today on Insiders. Well, thank you, Robert. It's really good to be with you. I wanted to uh, talk today about leadership, and I thought it would be fun to start out with your definition of what makes a leader or what you consider leadership. Well, Robert, I define leadership as the ability to inspire others to passionately pursue and then achieve a common goal. In other words, the inspiration to lead others to passionately pursue and then achieve a common goal is what I think leadership is all about. That's really good. Now, I spoke in the introduction about uh, your background with the Naval Academy. Was that really uh, formative in your developing your ideas about leadership? Well, even though it was a command and control military style of leadership where there was a lot of fear. I was fortunate to attend Annapolis with H. Ross Perot, but he was brigade commander, and then he went on to form electronic data systems and get a multi-billion dollar fortune. And when I used to stand and watch with Ross Perot, he told me to always seek and speak the truth, and then he'd show me examples of the midshipmen who were trying to get away with things, go around the regulations, beat the system, and then they'd get away with it for a while, but then 
they would always trip themselves up and they would end up discredited or they would either be expelled from the academy. So he said that along with honesty, we should be loyal to our shipmates. And I think what he taught me is that an anchor chain was only as strong as its weakest link and that we should respect each other and never try to succeed at someone else's expense. So he really practiced what he preached, and I like the fact that even 20 years later, I could see that he was still practicing that same kind of philosophy, which I think a leader doesn't really change philosophies, probably changes tactics, but keeps pretty steady. Mm -hmm. Talk about some of the qualities all great leaders possess. Well, I think being a role model by setting an example in your own behavior, I think if your, your own behavior doesn't match the battle cry or the call to action, that people really hesitate to follow you when the going gets tough. In other words, if your life is at stake and you're watching somebody who is telling you how to live, but they're not practicing that, you really wonder whether you should follow that. And, of course, we got messages like that during the Vietnam War when they were worried about whether government leaders had their interests in mind. And so I always think that walking your talk is probably number one. And, and I think also that many military leaders in the past they had personal habits that fit the battlefield mentality, but probably won't work today because we live in a, in a situation where you're an open book. We have instant access to knowledge so that our personal lives are much more open to scrutiny than they were before. But having said that, there are a lot more characteristics than that. I think a clear vision of the future, of being able to articulate that vision in a way that other people can see it too, and then they can identify it as a mission that they would want to pursue as well. That's a, a key element in leadership is that holding a vision of the future that other people can grasp and turn into a mission. And then I think being proactive and being calm and cool under fire and never reactive when things happen. And in other words, never reacting to a situation emotionally and having that countenance of coolness and calmness under fire is a a mark of any leader, whether it's in business or any other aspect in life. And I guess just a couple other things. I think today, much more than the past, leaders need to be listeners and stewards who get the team members to respect themselves rather than the leader demanding respect for himself or herself. And in order to do that, they have to subordinate their ego. And that's very difficult for a powerful, charismatic leader who is used to uh, shall we say, leading, sure, leading the pack, and to solicit input and feedback from the group and to be invisible in your leadership but pull out the qualities out of other people is a whole new ball game for, for leaders. And I think that's why we're going through such a transition in corporate America to find a new steward kind of leader because in the past that would look at as soft. Right, exactly. Well, talk about some people today that you would consider to be excellent leaders. Well, I just traveled throughout Asia with Norman Schwarzkopf, uh, General Schwarzkopf. I was really impressed with the fact that he believes that leadership is all about character and that character not only matters but is everything because of people who want to emulate and whose lives are on the line. So I'd say Schwarzkopf and Colin Powell, of course, because not only was he chairman of the Joint Chiefs and, and a really great candidate for president who didn't want to run, but here he is in a volunteer Effort And here is a top military leader in the United States who believes in stewardship and service right. rather than in charisma and this positioning. So I put him up the list. And I've got a couple other ones that are very different. One would be Steve Wynn, and he's the developer of, of the Mirage and the Bellagio Resorts in Las Vegas. And, of course, people would say, well, the Mirage is an invisible vision. But he is one of the most admired executives in America because... His organization, the Mirage Resorts, is the best place to work at over there because the employees have been able to be treated in a way so that their own personal dreams are dealt with, not just the corporate goals. And he's been able to have the employees buy into their own dreams, get excited about who they want to be. And he does an even better job than Disney in sprinkling Tinkerbell dust on the people, uh, you won't find people who want to quit. So I think a leader who attracts people who don't want to leave you is another great quality in a leader. Michael Dell, uh, I got to know him over in Hong Kong very well. At 34, he's got $12 billion in the bank, but money doesn't make a leader. What makes Michael Dell a leader is that he's way ahead on the curve 
of customer service and understanding that without giving the customer his or her way, making a computer to order as if it were a burger with lettuce and tomatoes and onions or whole <laughs> the onions. Right. He's been able to do that and sell $20 million a day on the Internet in computers at the age of 34 by realizing that he's only a conduit through which customer preferences flow. Right. Then, then I look at Oprah Winfrey and Sandra Day O'Connor. Oprah Winfrey, I think she's a leader because being the most powerful woman in the world in broadcasting and being the least likely candidate, you know, they said her nose was too flat and their right. eyes were too far apart and she was overweight and just the, she, she, just the wrong image, but she has resisted the temptation to turn her program into a tabloid free-for-all, and she doesn't pander to the bizarre, but but she really believes in doing something that is socially redeeming. And I think you could argue that uh, Adolf Hitler and Napoleon were leaders, but they really weren't. They were, they were demagogues. They were military men, but they did not know how to do things that in the long run would benefit other people. And finally, I guess Sandra Day O'Connor, because I've looked at her through the years as the first woman justice of the Supreme Court, and I found that she's very humble. She doesn't take honorariums for her speeches. And she's gracious and fair, and I think she exemplifies what our justice system should be about. So those are on my short list of leaders, and they're probably different from many others. Those are great examples, though. Another area that I've, I've heard you talk about that I think is fascinating is how the younger generation has become maybe confused in their selection of leaders. And, again, why do you think that is? Well, the reason I'm not more popular is that the entertainment media doesn't like me. And you can understand why they wouldn't like me, because I talk about them as not having elevated our perception of what a true leader should be. There's a disturbing trend that looks, style, and charm, and wit, and a certain amount of irreverence appeal in the media, and they really do sell tickets. And the problem is, if you're trying to sell tickets and make money, it's so easy to pander to the external and to the superficial. So I think what's really unfortunate is that kids learn by observing, imitating, and internalizing And it's almost as if each of us is wearing this superficial tattoo, and we're tattooing ourselves so that we can show superficially on the surface how we look, that we look different or that we look special. And it's very difficult to live up to the Michael Jordans and the Sammy Sosas and the the superheroes, and it's also difficult to live up to the people who are so good-looking in the television and runway shows that young people today feel either that they must perform superficially and materially or they're destined for a life of not being able to achieve the American dream. So I think it's very unfortunate that personality and sound bites and being made for television and made by television is kind of how we elect our leaders in this country today. And and it's easy to criticize, but I think what has to happen is something needs to change there in the leadership both in the country and and in business and and certainly at home. And I guess it does really point out the importance of the home environment and the leadership traits that you learn from your parents. Well, there's no question about it, and there's a big argument going on. The media says, uh, if you don't like us, just turn us off or don't watch us. It's up to the parents to regulate the children. And that's very true, except for one thing, is that it is impossible to hide from the impact of electronic media. I mean, every child in the world is affected by exposure. And since advertising works so well, exposure will override many of the parental rules that are being set. So I think what's really exciting, though, is that industry, business, has the money because they're interested in making a profit to be in a global economy. And business is beginning to personally develop leadership qualities in employees, turning them to entrepreneurs so they can be responsible for their own future and, shall we say, be free agents who are, who are skillable and willable. Mm-hmm. And I think those same people have children. So I think I really opt out for the free enterprise system for business to expose people who are parents to leadership qualities that will endure. And then those qualities, because they're personal development qualities, will be implanted and imparted into the next generation. And I think it may take 
20, 40, 60 years, but I think that you have to be optimistic that the pendulum will swing and that business integrity will spill over into home integrity. And I don't think it'll come from the government because it's too hard to legislate leadership. It's much better to set an example at the grassroots. So I think it'll happen from business back to the home, and hopefully we'll be more demanding of our entertainment media to do things that when you walk out of the theater, you feel a little better for being human. A vision statement is a very important statement because it should be values-based, based on a set of shared values, values that any of the employees would hold worthy. As a matter of fact, if your goal and your vision is to increase stockholders' wealth, I'm sure that your employees will do a good day's work because they're professionals, let's face it. But if it's based on a shared value, you can get them to go beyond self-imposed limitations. So vision is a values-based statement, and I believe it is visual. So a vision statement needs to paint a verbal portrait. By the way, if it paints a verbal portrait so that people can remember it in their mind, not unlike the vision statement that John F. Kennedy gave us when we wanted to go to the moon, he didn't say, in 10 years, we're going to have the goal of being judged number one in space technology in the world. No, the goal was, we're going to put a man on the moon. We saw that in our mind, we didn't have to find a filing cabinet to see what that vision statement Kennedy gave us was. We all knew what it was, and it was based on a sense of shared values, something that we really wanted to do, something that we, <laughs> we kind of wanted to do even as kids. It was something that the employees of NASA, the Space Administration, could have told their kids, and their kids would have been proud of what their dads and moms did for a living because it was, again, a sense of shared values. So that vision statement then has to paint a verbal portrait, and if it can paint a verbal portrait so we can all remember it in our minds, it can be clear. Why don't we paint it then? Why don't we paint it on a wall so that people can see it, so that employees and so that customers, anyone walking through your building, can see exactly what your vision is and where you're going? In an empowered world, if we don't have vision, we're going to be going rapidly in many different directions. It's important to have that focus. To get others to change, you need involvement and participation. If you're not part of the process, you're going to be against it. People don't like change that's imposed. For example, if I was your boss and said, hey, tomorrow you're taking a vacation. Here's where you're going. Here's what you're eating. Here's exactly what you're going to do hour by hour. Already, you don't like this vacation. You need to involve people. Often, we will put together a planning committee, and their job is to come up with a strategic plan that will affect everybody in the company. And after they study it, they will report to us what our future will be. Not very empowering, is it? By the way, are you likely to like what they come up with? Well, maybe not. Another alternative to that would be to say, we have a change process that we feel we need to go through because the world is changing and technology is changing. And we've identified some people that we think can help us to do that, but we need everyone's input. So what we're going to do is use communication technologies, email, voicemail, and other tools at our disposal to keep you posted on every day's meeting and exactly what the topics are so that if you have feedback, if you have input, if you have a reason why we shouldn't or should change, you know what, we'd like to hear it. It's your turn to speak up. What you do now is you are bringing people in to the process instead of pushing them away from the process. The most important thing I've learned about managing and motivating people is that behavior is controlled by its consequences. I learned this from Bob Lauber, who wrote Putting the One Minute Manager to Work with Me. And what that really means is that goal-setting starts behavior, but what really impacts behavior is what happens after it. In our book, Putting the One-Minute Manager to Work, we developed a little model called the ABCs of management. A stands for activator. It's anything that happens before people begin to perform. An activator, obviously, is goal-setting because it has to come before you can expect people to perform well. All good performance starts with clear goals. Another activator is training. 
because, you know, you'd like to train people ahead of time to do their job. What's interesting about goal setting and training, though, in this country, a lot of times we do those after people are performing poorly. It's like our kids, you know. All of a sudden, we get a bad report card. Now we start talking to them about goals. These are the kind of grades I want. Well, why didn't we do it ahead of time? Same way with training. We put people out in the job, and they're failing. We said, gee, now we better get them trained. It's too late. We ought to do it ahead of time. So activators are, are anything that you want to do up front before people are starting to perform. That's why orientation is important. That's why setting your vision and your mission and your values and communicating to those people, those are all important things that need to be up front before people start to do things. B stands for behavior, and you can substitute the word performance, okay? So first you activate, then people start to perform. Now what you want to do is observe their performance. Because now we're moving to C, which is consequence. And a consequence is what happens after people begin to perform. There are four basic consequences. The most popular consequence that people get to their performance is no response. <laughs> they do something and nobody says anything. I mean, so many people are ignored in their performance. Nobody's watching. Nobody seems to care. Now, in the beginning, when nobody's responding to what you're doing, you might work a little harder just to get noticed. But after a while, if nobody seems to care, performance seems to go down. But it's the most popular response, no response. The next most popular response is a negative response. In fact, with no response and negative response, you have the most popular management style in America, which we call leave alone zap. Leave alone zap. Uh, you're leaving people alone, you're not observing, and then their performance gets bad enough, and you seagull in, as I mentioned, and zap them. And so that's not very motivating for them. A negative consequence is good when you're dealing with an experienced performer who's not living up to their expectations. I mean, you might want to reprimand them, you might want to do something that says, this isn't appropriate. You know, you can do better than that. It's not something that you do when you're trying to teach a learner. You don't punish learners. The third consequence is an interesting one because it's not negative, but it's also not positive. It's redirection. That's best when you're dealing with learners who make a mistake. If they make a mistake, you say, gee, Maybe I didn't make it clear enough, and you're now back into what goal setting and activating again and starting the process again. Redirection. Redirect is not positive or negative. You take the blame, but what you do is go back to goal setting. And you say, maybe I didn't make it clear. Maybe I didn't make it clear. Here's what I want you to do. So you start the process again. Now, a, a redirect is appropriate for can't-do problems, people who don't have the skills. They need training. A reprimand or any negative consequence is only appropriate for won't-do problems. They got the skills, but for some reason they're not doing it. If you reprimand, if you punish a learner, you will immobilize them. In the consistency area, what we're saying is behaving the same way in similar circumstances. So you have to be there to observe what's going on, and if it's what you want or it's in the direction of what you want, you praise it. Remember, in the beginning, praise progress. Don't wait for somebody to do something exactly right before you praise them. Otherwise, you'll wait forever. Suppose you want to teach a kid how to speak, and the kid's never spoken before, and you want him to say, give me a glass of water, please. If you wait for that full sentence before you give the kid any water, what do you got? You got a dead, dehydrated kid. So I can't say enough for the power of praising, catching people doing things right. Now, if people are not performing well, if they're good performers and are just getting lax, you can reprimand them. If they're learners and aren't performing well, you redirect them. Now, the one I've saved to last 
of the four consequences is positive, because positive is the thing that will increase future behavior. No response after a while, people's performance goes down. Negative uh, response, people stop doing what you what they were doing. So that stops behavior. Redirection gets them going again. But what really keeps them moving in the direction you want is a positive consequence. I just love to teach people about catching people doing things right. I've said for years that the key to developing people is to catch them doing something right. And people ask me all the time, well, do you have any suggestions on what I can do when I catch him doing something right? Well, colleague Bob Nelson, who's our vice president for product development, has written a best-selling book entitled A Thousand and One Ways to Reward Employees. And Bob researched all kinds of ways that you can catch people doing things right and actually follow up with something that is fun. He spent three years surveying 1,500 companies to find out the most effective and innovative ways that managers use to catch people doing things right. The organizations Bob has written about have learned the power of recognition. A few examples might be helpful. Textronics, an Oregon-based company, has a wonderful award that they give people. It's called You've Done Something Good Award. And they have note cards, and managers can write down a personal thank you and deliver it to another employee. Bell Atlantic's cellular telephone division in Philadelphia named cell sites after top employees. Serpa Corporation, a software company in San Jose, California, uses an old ugly bowling trophy purchased at a pawn shop as a pass-around award for spectacular results achieved. The trophy has taken on real significance among the people in the company. My feeling is that once managers see that giving praise and recognition is directly linked to performance, they'll see it as an integral part of their job and start working to overcome these historical obstacles and objectives. Criticism from a boss can be the cause of joyless workdays as well as be a blow to your self-esteem. When you get called on the carpet, you may feel like quitting, crying, or else getting even. In a work setting where criticism reigns, everyone feels threatened and therefore performs less effectively. Dealing with an especially critical or demanding boss is not easy. If your boss is in the habit of breathing down your neck or throwing a fit, what options do you have? Most of us smile compliantly at our bosses while we are seething on the inside. Some employees fantasize about how great life would be if only they could fire their boss, change jobs, or quit. Responding to a supercritical boss raises the important issue of what you resist persists. The more you try to comply with or disobey a critical boss, the more he or she will grate on your nerves. Even if you go out of your way to make sure every little detail is perfect, a supercritical boss will find something to criticize. The issue is not how to avoid criticism. In fact, many bosses think it is their job to find something to criticize. In some situations, you may be an unfair victim of office politics. You might get criticized simply because the guilty party is absent or is immune to criticism as a result of his or her rank or a relationship to the president of the company. Sometimes you may feel unfairly blamed for the inadequacies of a product or management policy. Your boss may need to let off steam, and you happen to be the person within shouting distance. Criticism is bound to be a part of any job. The key is learning to respond effectively. Here are some important points to keep in mind when dealing with a critical boss. Don't make a globally negative judgment about your competence based on an honest mistake. Learn from your mistakes rather than passing the buck. If there were contributing problems outside your control, describe these realistically without making excuses. Timing is important. 
If your boss has just received news of losing a major contract or source of revenue, give him or her time to ventilate frustration and anger. Don't take anything personally your boss says in a fit of rage. Instead, you might understand and empathize with your boss's feelings. In order to deal successfully with a critical boss, you will invariably need to distinguish your boss's demands from your own inner critic. A boss's criticisms or demands may be minor compared with the pressures and insecurities you heap upon yourself. The sooner you can stop beating yourself up for a minor error, the sooner your boss's criticism will cease to burden you. With high self-esteem, you will feel better and your performance will improve. Becoming your own best boss means being open to feedback and feeling good about your competence, even as you learn from your mistakes. The experts say that the primary cause of trouble among young people, where trouble exists, is caused by the lack of values of their parents. Their parents don't stand for anything. Nothing in their lives is exactly right or wrong, but rather a matter of, can you get away with it? The root of the trouble is a lack of any final authority. The parents don't tell their children what to do, but instead ask them, what do you want to do? They ask their children to make decisions they themselves are afraid or ill-equipped to make. The children thus find their worlds even more confused and fuzzy. Young people are going to disagree with their parents, especially as teenagers. They want to disagree and assert their independence of mind, just as we did. But they don't want their disagreement to fall into a swamp. They want their parents to stand for something, something they know and feel to be right. One of the most common complaints of young people today is that they wish someone would make a decision for them. They know they're not ready to make major decisions to major problems. In a survey, 80% of the young people questioned thought that adults were much too soft on juvenile delinquents. If they were given the opportunity themselves, they would mete out far rougher punishment than their more indulgent elders. A lack of parental authority is almost always found at the root of juvenile problems. As a rule, they are rootless kids from rootless families. It's said that parents no longer have long talks with the youngsters. The young people too often feel like strangers in their own homes. Young people thirst for knowledge, but too often hear things of a kind that tend to break down their belief in people. I remember hearing a father gleefully report to his son about a business deal he'd just concluded. His actual words were, I stole it, and then he went on to describe in great detail how he had pulled the wool over someone's eyes and had made a large purchase for a fraction of its real value. Now, what went through his son's mind? I know what went through mine. What sort of values can a young person grow up with when he's led to believe that you are smart and clever when you can cheat someone, that the world is a jungle where only the quick and the dishonest can survive? It is, of course, nothing of the kind. And he should know, perhaps he does, that it's his father's lack of a sense of values and fitness and stature as a human being that have been responsible for his repeated setbacks in business and in his personal relationships. Our sons and daughters look to us for guidelines to which they can cling to make their ways in the world, and it's our responsibility to give them good ones. A plant will accurately reflect the soil and climate in which it was raised, and it's the same with children. Let's make sure the soil is rich and deep. Let's stand for what we know to be right and against what we know to be wrong. How many times have you had a good idea, talked about it a while, and then did nothing about it, only to find out later that someone else had made a fortune, or at least a very good thing, out of the idea you had done nothing about? This has happened to a lot of us at one time or another, I'm sure. It would be impossible, I suppose, to develop every good idea we get, but sometimes by wisely investing in someone we know, trust, and respect, we can achieve the same thing without working at it at all. In the spring of 1903, James Cousins told his sister Rosetta about an automobile business organized by a Detroit coal dealer and mechanic. Cousins said he was going to work for the company as office manager and urged his sister to invest $200. She'd never heard of this particular coal dealer and mechanic before, but she trusted her brother, but not completely, in that she didn't invest 200 but she reluctantly went along for $100 in what seemed to her logical mind as a rather harebrained venture. Cousins was sold that the idea was sound. He signed a note and managed to borrow $2,400 so that with his sister's $100, he could acquire 25 shares, about 2.5% of the company. He later continued to prove his faith in the venture by buying out some frightened investors to increase his holdings to 11.5%. 
In the next 16 years, Rosetta's investment of $100 brought dividends alone amounting to $95,000, and she sold her original $100 worth of stock for $260,000. Her brother's share earned him in dividends alone $5 million, and he finally sold his 11.5% interest to the founder of the company for $30 million. The 12 original investors gambled $28,000 between them. They took out $250 million. And the man who finally got all the stock in his company back, Henry Ford, became a billionaire. Now, for every story like that one, there might be thousands which didn't work out well. But you will find that following an idea you know to be sound, or at least firmly believe to be sound, through to its conclusion, can bring you a fine return on your faith, time, and money. The secret is to stay with your idea through all the ups and downs, the discouragement, which is so often a part of getting something started. Remember that if it were easy, everyone would be doing it. As Andrew Jackson once said, one man with courage makes a majority. Bernard M. Baruch said there will always be opportunities for the well-disciplined man. When you find your one big idea, nurse it, cultivate it, stay with it until you succeed. It might take a year or ten years, but the time will pass anyway. The important thing is to look before you jump. Don't grab the first good idea that comes along. Keep looking until you find an idea so exciting in itself that you can't sleep nights for thinking about it. When that happens, then you'll know it's the idea you've been looking for all the days of your life. But you have to look. There's a book written by Jose Ortega y Gasset titled Man and Crisis. In there is a passage which goes as follows. A great proportion of the thoughts with which we live are not thought out by us with the evidence in hand. With some shame we recognize that the greater part of the things we say we do not understand very well, and if we ask ourselves why we say them, we will observe that we say them only for this reason, that we have heard them said, that other people say them. We have abandoned ourselves to other people, and we live in a state of otherness, constantly deceiving and defrauding ourselves. We're afraid of our own life, which is synonymous with solitude, and we flee from it, from its genuine reality, from the effort it demands. We hide our own selves behind the selves of other people. We disguise ourselves behind society. Well, what do you think of that? And you know why so many people talk and act like other people without thinking much about what they're doing or saying? I think there are two reasons. The first is that if they talk and act like everyone else, they feel they'll be readily accepted by others, that they won't have to run the danger of being different. And the second reason they go along with what others say and do is because they're too lazy and largely too ignorant to look the answers up for themselves. Have you ever thought how terrible it would be if you were following people who were following you? The big trouble comes from acting like people who don't know any more than we do and who in turn are acting like us. We can never get any place that way. It's all right to play follow the leader, but don't play follow the follower. Find yourself a leader to emulate, and if the guy next door happens to be the kind of a person you'd like to be someday, fine, follow him. But if he's no smarter than you are, he's nobody to act, talk, or think like, now is he? Be friends and good neighbors, but look to someone else as an example on which to pattern your life. As it was written, we have abandoned ourselves to other people, and we live in a state of otherness, constantly deceiving and defrauding ourselves. We're afraid of our own life which is synonymous with solitude, and we flee from it, from its genuine reality, from the effort it demands. We hide our own selves behind the selves of other people. We disguise ourselves behind society. You know, when you get to thinking of things like this, it's time to get off by yourself and do a little self-examining. It's time to ask yourself, just what kind of a person do I want to become? Do I want to be a carbon copy of the people up and down the block? Another faceless head bobbing on the vast sea of a kind of average limbo? Am I marking time, just waiting for time to pass? What we can and do waste is ourselves, what we could do but don't, the love we do not give, the efforts we do not make, the kindnesses we fail to bestow, and the happiness we neglect to earn. No, the waste is not time, but the things that could be ours, if only we would learn to understand why we are here. The next time you start to say something, ask yourself if you really believe it, and ask yourself, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> 